and opportunities. And I have to say that this has been uh, a terrific crowd. The presentations so far have been very interesting, fascinating. Um, and I hope that some of what I say or much of what I say will um, integrate many of the needs of the different sectors. So first, I need to make some acknowledgments. Um, many of the ideas and work that I'm going to present were done while I was on sabbatical leave uh, at Climate Earth. So university faculty get to go on these sabbaticals. It's a terrific perk of the job. And I spent 10 months at a startup company in San Francisco at Climate Earth. Two people in particular contributed very substantially to this presentation, um, Dr. Corinne Reichweiser and Frankie Rodolfi. I was supported during the time of my sabbatical um, by the Purdue sabbatical program and, of course, by my sabbatical host. All right, so let's start with one quick slide about drivers for water management. What is driving institutions and entities to want to manage water? So this is a map of consumptive use and renewable water supply. And this is a map that was um, constructed by the United States Geological Survey. And basically what this shows is renewable water supply um, as it is consumed in different regions of the United States. So I know this is probably a little bit hard to read in the back, but you notice that the darker colored regions are consuming a larger fraction of the renewable supply in that region, all right? So for example, in the, I believe that's the lower Colorado, there is slightly greater than 100% of the renewable water supply in that region that's being consumed for all purposes. And I'll get into greater detail about different sectors and different rates of water consumption. So uh, interestingly enough, there are actually mandatory um, disclosure requirements, and these are related to climate change and water physical risks associated with water related to climate change can trigger disclosure. There's voluntary reporting. This has come um, into greater visibility, I'd say, in the last five years or so, where companies self-report their water use um, to various stakeholders. There are assessments by NGOs. So Ceres actually came out with a very interesting report about water and water risks for corporations. There are supply chain stakeholders. There's internal operations, right, who need access to water and water of a certain quality. And there are business development issues. There have been, I think, a half dozen instances in the United States where power or energy development was constrained by water, um, water limits to supply. OK. So just to make sure we're all talking about the same quantities, I have one quick slide on terminology as related to water. Consumptive use, which is going to be the focus of my presentation, is basically water that is withdrawn by evaporation, transpiration, or incorporated into products or crops, otherwise consumed, and removed from the immediate water environment. All right, so there are many uses of water that are consumptive. Um, one uh, use of water that is not consumptive or not very highly consumptive would be, for example, water taken from a river to, um, into a cooling tower and then returned to the river. That is not highly consumptive because most of the water is returned. But consumptive water is what I'm focused on. And total water use can be thought of as scope one, two, and three. All right? And this follows fairly closely a water footprint framework um, that considers uh, water impacts throughout the supply chain. So scope one is water consumed at facilities owned or controlled by an organization. Scope two, what I refer to as scope two, is water consumed to produce electricity owned or controlled by an organization. And scope three is water consumed to produce goods and services to support all the functions of an organization. So scope one, two, and three. And Scope one, which is the easiest to measure for an entity, is direct. And then scope two and three make up the indirect. All right, so that's just a little bit of terminology that I'll be using in the presentation. So why would you want to measure total water use? Total water use. In many cases, uh, the scope three is greater than scope one or two. All right, so it's important to measure the water consumption of all the various scopes if you want to get a sense of what your water footprint 
is. And I've included a table from um, some researchers at Carnegie Mellon University. And what this shows is total water consumption in a couple of different sectors. So there's total water, billions of gallon, and I believe that this was on an annual basis. All right, so this is one year in that sector. Total water, billions of gallons, direct, indirect, and then the key quantity uh, at the very end is the ratio of the direct to the indirect water consumption. So in many cases, but not all cases, the indirect actually is quite substantial. Right? So the direct versus the indirect sometimes is much larger, and in some cases, it's actually um, much smaller. So in other words, that scope three water is very substantial for an organization. OK, so um, despite the importance of indirect water use, there are a few companies that currently measure or manage it, right? in part because um, there, it's difficult to get that kind of data. So in a report by Ceres that came out about a year ago, um, corporate reporting on water risk, they benchmarked 100 companies. And this was, these were global companies. And one of the most important outcomes was that none of the companies that they benchmarked were able to provide comprehensive data on their supplier's water performance. So if you've ever tried to get this from suppliers, usually companies get it through supplier surveys, right? So they have their suppliers fill out a survey and, and give it back to the company. So no companies provided comprehensive data on their supplier's water performance. Only six companies included any water accounting data with their financial filings. And the report included uh, industries from the beverage, chemical, electric power, food, home building, mining, so on. A, a broad, broad selection of sectors, I guess is my point, with the last bullet. OK, so why is it difficult to um, measure the water in a supply chain? And I think before we answer that question, it's important to think about what's in a supply chain. So what's in a supply chain? This is a water consumption map for a typical US hospital. And I will get into the data that we use to generate this map. It's based on actual Bureau of Economic Analysis data um, and the natural resource accounts in the United States, which are based on USGS data. Okay, so these, let me explain what the chart is and then I'll explain how we got the bubbles. So <clears throat> this is an average US hospital and it is represented in the center by that gray bubble. So the gray bubble is the total fresh water consumption across the supply chain. And it turns out to be about eight kilograms of water per US dollar for that hospital. All right, so that's the gray bubble. Only a small portion of tiers two and three are shown. So what we've done with this chart is we've blown up the raw meat bubble, right? And you can see everything that contributes to raw meat. And then tier three is crops cattle, grain, all others that contribute to tier two. So if you look at the hospital, it's tier one suppliers. Um, actually, a lot of them are food related, probably because of cafeterias and hospitals that serve patients and staff. And then we go back, right? So tier one supplied by tier two, which is supplied by tier three. And keep in mind that there are multiple suppliers for each of these categories, right? So each of these bubbles represents a category Right, or a sector, and there are probably different vendors or suppliers in each of those categories. What's interesting to me in terms of what a hospital would do with this if they wanted to reduce uh, water consumption, at least at the tier one level, is that their core function purchases aren't major contributors to water consumption. In other words, if you look at plastic products, in vitro diagnostic substances, and drugs, they're relatively small in terms of water consumption compared to things like seafood, raw meat, et cetera, et cetera, which of course are important for a hospital if they're gonna supply a cafeteria, but in terms of a core function of a hospital, right, providing medical care, their core function purchases don't seem to contribute as much to water consumption. So that's good information to have, right, if you're a hospital and you wanna make decisions and also try to reduce your water consumption. So that's one example. The other example is 
water consumption in an automaker supply chain. Right? So the gray bubble, again, represents water withdrawals across a supply chain. And that number happens to be 14 kilograms per US dollar. I should say, I'm sorry I didn't mention, the, the size of the bubbles is proportional to the water contribution to the um, total. All right? And then the blue bubble is direct. So direct scope one, water. And then the whole bubble is water withdrawals across the supply chain. So what's interesting about this is that uh, leather actually makes a surprising contribution to the total water consumption in this automaker. Auto parts, not surprisingly, is probably the biggest contributor, followed by electricity, um, leather, carpet, tires, and so on. So as you move um, counterclockwise, the, the water consumption goes down. So, and I know material selection and material substitution are not necessarily always straightforward, but again, if you're an automaker, you're looking for ways to reduce water consumption um, from tier one, it seems like you could replace leather seats with some other material, right? Okay, the other interesting thing about this automaker map is that it goes back four tiers. So the hospital map went back three tiers, okay? So one, what we're trying to answer, what's in a supply chain? And I'm trying to give you a sense of the complexity of supply chains, which is one reason, one big reason why it's hard to get water consumption data. So tier two is shown here. So we blew up the auto parts in tier two. So the auto parts are made of textiles and fibers and ferrous metal and leather and non-ferrous metal, iron and steel, and electricity, right? Electricity, as you'll probably notice, has shown up in many of the different tiers. It shows up in lots of different tiers. And then tier three, is a blow up of the iron and steel. And then tier four is a blow up from the cattle, which leads to animal slaughter, which then contributes to leather, right? And again, each of these different categories, right? The, ca the carpet, tiles, textiles, glass in tier one have their own tier two, tier three, tier four, right? So if you can imagine this diagram that has all of the bubbles um, expanded back to all of the different tiers, you would get a sense of how complex a supply chain is and therefore why it is difficult to have scope three water measurements. Okay, so let me talk a little bit about approaches um, and then I will talk about a case study that we did with Central Concrete where we applied our methodology to calculate their scope one, two, and three water consumption. And the methods that I'm going to focus on are based on input-output life cycle assessment, all right? And the, the, the methods that are most commonly used currently are IO, or process-based LCA, or supplier surveys. Okay, so input-output LCA links the economic activity of a country or region to environmental impacts. And in input output databases in the US include CETA, which is the basis for the bubble charts that you saw. The supplier maps for the US hospital and the um, automaker are based on actual economic data in the US and actual environmental emissions data that have been combined into an input output database. There are other databases. So Carnegie Mellon has the EIO LCA database and there's an open IO database. I think uh, that is supported by the University of Arkansas. Okay, so the economic accounts and the natural resources accounts of a country are merged. In, in the case of my analysis, they're, the country is the United States. And over 400 commodities and services are included in the database, right? So the data sources include the Bureau of Economic Analysis, EPA, USGS, many other federal agencies, right? And the economic data captures all of the transactions between different sectors. So who's buying and who's selling to whom in a given year is part of the input-output database, which is how you get the supply chain in the different tiers. <clears throat> the environmental impacts of material extraction and manufacture are included. So this is what's called a cradle-to-gate analysis. We don't think about user impacts, all right, just so we're clear. It's cradle-to-gate. And this methodology actually merges an organization's financial data, um, such as procurement, with an IO database, 
Okay? So, for example, if a company purchased $1,456 of item X, right, that item belongs to one of the 400 sectors that's in the BIA data, and we know that that sector is 1.2 kilograms of water per dollar. Right? Based on that, the purchase that that company made then results in a certain amount of water consumed. Okay? So there's the input, output, economic database, the financial data, the institution, which generally is high quality, it's audited, and so on and so forth, and gives us this water consumption data. So scope one, two, and three, if we unpack that a little bit, are based on water purchases and or production by the company. So obviously some companies produce their own water, minus the discharge, because this is consumption, not just withdrawals. So consumption is actually harder to measure because of that. So water purchases and or production minus discharge. This is a little bit out of order, I'm sorry. Um, then electricity purchases, which are converted to uh, water through factors that have been produced by NREL. So the National Renewable Energy Lab has different factors kilograms of water per kilowatt electricity based on where you've purchased your electricity. So there are different factors for different states. So based on the electricity purchases that a company provides, um, we can calculate scope two water. All right. And then scope three, materials and services. There are water factors again in that input output database. We have dollar amounts, right? Dollar amounts for each purchase and we get scope three water. So based on financial data and utility log data, we can calculate for some time period total water, scope one, two, and three. So let me talk a little bit about a case study. Climate Earth, uh, I mean Central Concrete, is a client of Climate Earth. And they are a major supplier of ready-mix concrete and building materials and a division of US Concrete. The company provided financial data from 26 profit centers in the San Francisco Bay Area, including four batch plants and four stores locations, and provided utility log information to us. We calculated scope one, two, and three water consumption for the company. Key again, it's relatively easy to get withdrawal data. Consumption is harder because you basically have to do a water balance, right? You have to know what comes in, what's consumed, and then what you what you release. And concrete's an important construction material, all right? And any opportunity to reduce environmental impacts uh, would be desirable. Okay, so what we determined for Central is that their scope three water was about 77% of their total. This is for 2010, all right? So we did this for one year. Um, that's the year that we got the data for. So 2010, their scope three, their indirect water was about 77%. And scope two and scope three, uh, scope two and scope one both come in under 15%. Their water intensity was anywhere between 139 and 185 gallons of water per cubic yard. And the total was 180 million gallons of water. Okay, so let me give you a couple of calibration points. 180 million gallons compared to, you know, what does it mean? Well, an average person in the US consumes about 36,500 gallons a year, all right? Lake Tahoe is 39 trillion gallons, so big, 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 much bigger compared to 180 million. Olympic-sized swimming pool is 630 gallons, all right, compared to 180 million that uh, was consumed by Central. All right, so there are um, other things that we can look at within the company. So there were two plants that we compared specifically, the Stockton plant water consumption and the Oakland Fifth Avenue plant water consumption. Again, scope one, two, and three for each of the plants. And what's interesting about this is that each plant might choose different strategies for reducing total water. All right, so if you look at Stockton plant water consumption, close to 80% is scope three, 79%. Whereas with Oakland Fifth Avenue, it's more like 70%. So the types of strategies that these plants could choose could include 
process or operational changes. So that would change direct water consumption, right? Things you could do directly. Energy conservation, right? Which would reduce scope two or procurement decisions, which would then affect scope three, changing what you buy, which impacts scope three water consumption. So it seems that um, for Stockton plant water consumption, if they're looking to make, say, a 15% reduction, whatever the percentage that is, um, Stockton plant actually has uh, less flexibility. Really, they should probably be looking at scope three, right, for total water, because scope three is such a big percentage for that plant. Okay, what about materials? All right, so we looked at different plants. Um, what about different materials? So we can look at water consumption by plant and material detail. And if we look at Stockton plant, um, what's contributing to that approximately 80% water consumption in scope three? So what I've done is break out the pink wedge of the pie into its own little pie, right? Um, and I'm sorry, there are so many different colors. I know it's a little bit eye popping. And I'm just gonna talk about the top three. So what are the top contributors to scope three in terms of materials? Fine aggregate, about 21%. Cement, coarse aggregate, right? So we were able to um, break this out based on, of course, what they purchased, right? And then the others are all less than about 5%. The 10.4% you see in the pie chart happened to be other. So there are many, many other materials that tend to, happen to be smaller. If you add them up, they're all about 10%. But the top three we're able to capture. Another interesting comparison you can make um, with this kind of methodology is comparing GHG to water. All right. So now these pie charts are for the same plant, Oakland, Fifth Avenue. And one is for scope one, two, or three GHG. And it looks like one of the legends got lost. There, there should be a scope three. It's uh, the green. And then scope one, two, or three, water consumption, right? Oops, let me go back. So uh, as you can see, scope three GHG is close to 95% of the total for that particular plant, greenhouse gases, and 70% for water. So if you're looking at more than one metric, right, for your sustainability report or for operations or for whatever purposes um, you as an entity want to reduce environmental impact, now you can think of balancing GHG versus water impacts. So in contrast to water reduction strategies, probably the best GHG reduction strategy is through procurement changes, right? Because most of it, really 95% of it um, is scope three, GHG. Very little of it is direct or scope two. Another interesting point is that with this kind of analysis, you can benchmark, right, against an industry average. So um, you can calculate industry averages based on the input-output database, right? So there's an in industry average here. And what I've shown are just two bars. Uh, the percent contribution to total of GHG or water consumption of these different materials, right? So of these different materials that Central would purchase, there's a GHG impact and there's a water consumption impact. And how, how does that compare to the industry average? Well, two insights. As a percentage of total water consumed, the central scope one is a little bit less than industry average and the scope two is slightly higher. So in this particular case, they seem to be pretty in line with an industry average in terms of benchmarking. And then with the GHG, you can see that a large part of that um, actually comes from uh, a very different material than the majority that's contributing to the water consumption. So again, that emphasizes balance, right? You may want to reduce GHG by changing materials, but then there's a, another dimension, which is water, to consider. Okay, so let me talk a little bit about linking consumption to environmental impacts because now you have a sense of the magnitude of 180 million gallons compared to a couple of different uh, calibration points. But from an environmental standpoint, what does it mean? Well, it's very, very, very dependent on locality. So unlike something like GHG, which gets emitted and then mixes into the global atmosphere and does have local effects, but not necessarily at the same place where it was emitted, 
water impacts actually are quite localized. So not only do you need to know quantity in terms of data, you need to know location, right? And right now, the water data that we have sometimes is um, at a very fine level and at other times is very aggregated in terms of locale. So quantifying the volume of water consumption is only the first step. And in LCA methodology, characterization is actually a key step towards analyzing the environmental impacts of resource use. This requires location-specific um, information about water use. All right, so characterizing consumption quantifies the location-specific nature of the impacts. And one approach that is widely accepted um, by people who calculate water consumption or think about water and do water footprints is something called the water stress index. The water stress index. And conceptually, water stress is the ratio of the total annual freshwater withdrawals to hydrologic availability, all right? And WSI is calculated from WTA, all right? So withdrawals to hydrologic availability, you start with the WTA and you get a WSI value, and it's calculated to fit into the framework of LCA in that it's a simple multiplier, all right? So to characterize water use, to start to make sense of what it means environmentally and go beyond just a quantity, right, from data to information, you need to multiply water consumption volume times the water stress index for the location for which the water was consumed or removed. Okay, so quickly, this is from a publication that came out in 2009, Pfister, Kohler, and Helwig. They calculated based on uh, um, a number of different scientific data sets, WSI values for different regions um, around the world. And this is actually available as a Google Earth layer, all right? And basically, water consumption impacts can vary um, depending on the location. And the WSI is expressed in these colors as being less water stressed in the yellow, right, or green areas, and more water stressed in the blue and dark blue areas. So that's sort of where, how you read the map by color. I, you probably cannot read the legend. Well, you can read it a little bit. Um, and it's certain parts of the world are very stressed. You can see the western United States, in particular, compared to the eastern United States, shows very different WSI values. All right? So I want to emphasize this is not the only way. A lot of different organizations have different ways of thinking about the risk associated with water consumption. Right? But this is a way that, in my opinion, the WSI is based on very sound science and very good data sets. Okay, so water stress index, and the whole concept of that is that if water is being used by one entity, it cannot simultaneously be consumed by another, right? So there's some competition, obviously, in the users. So WSI is based on water availability and demand for each watershed. And <clears throat> let me just give you three examples, three quick examples. Once you go from availability and demand to water stress, you then go to damage assessment. So what kind of damage occurs due to this water consumption? Sometimes there is very little damage. Other times it could be um, quite substantial. So three categories in this framework, and these are taken from Eco Indicator 99, which is an LCA framework. So there could be damage to resources. And in the WSI way of calculating, um, or characterizing, I'm sorry, characterizing damage, resources are measured specifically as the energy required to make depleted water available. So if you are in a water stressed region, one way to measure damage to resources is to think about the amount of energy it would take to make the water that's been depleted. All right, remember, the LCA framework is, is um, a framework that allows you to calculate different environmental impacts and compare them, right, to impacts for, for different, um, processes. Ecosystem quality, specifically damage to vegetation. So plants are a crucial base for ecosystems. And then human health, specifically malnutrition, right? Agricultural ir irrigation displaced in competition for water. So let me emphasize that there are numerical factors for estimating the damage associated with the water consumption. All of these numerical factors were calculated based on things like population, 
Um, they were based on NASA land cover data to figure out vegetation and so on and so forth. Right? So there were scientific data sets that were used to calculate the damage factors, which then are used to figure out damage or compare damage. So quickly, yeah, I, I will wrap up in a few minutes. So let's consider scope one impacts. All right, so if you want to think about the um, consequences of consuming water in your direct water consumption, let's think about California versus Michigan. If you were to pull up a map of the WSI values and the damage factors that I showed, the human resources, uh, the resources, excuse me, ecosystem quality and um, human health, you would see a number of different values for different regions. And not surprisingly, in California, the water stress index is much higher than in Michigan, okay? So when you convert that then, so let's say a facility consumes 1,000 meters, meter cubed of water in South San Francisco, right? The water stress index uh, in South San Francisco is one, which is the maximum. And the different damage factors you can see um, show that, for example, ecosystem quality, would be a certain um, number of square meters of vegetation a year that would be impacted, and the resources turn out to be a certain number of megajoules to make the water that was depleted, all right? So what if you had a facility in Michigan, say Detroit, all right? Water scarcity, first of all, is much less, so the water scarcity index in Michigan um, actually is quite small. Right, you can see that the WSI, I'm sorry, I didn't actually put the number in, but the WSI value times 1,000 cubic meters turns out to be 34.8. That's the characterized water consumption, right? The characterized water consumption. Even though physically it's the same volume, because the water stress in Michigan is so much less, the characterized volume is also smaller, which then cascades down to the calculations of damage. So ecosystem quality, resources, and so on are much less in Michigan. So for companies, say, that have facilities throughout the United States or even all over the world, if they are thinking about company-wide strategies to reduce impacts, you can think on different facilities, specifically in this case water, reducing water consumption at different facilities will result in different types of reduction to the ultimate damage, right? So of course, reducing water consumption in general is gonna be a good thing no matter where you do it, but you can leverage that reduction if you're concerned about maximizing the damage control, so to speak. You can leverage that reduction depending on where you are and what the damage factors are and the WSI. So let me make just a couple of conclusions and recommendations. The first is that understanding total water consumption requires quantifying all of the scopes, right? and calculating total water consumption helps identify reduction strategies at specific facilities and specific material groups, if that's relevant. Uh, given the location-specific nature of water consumption impacts, companies should identify points of water vulnerability. And there is an urgent need to measure and integrate data about water consumption, both quantity and location, across the supply chain. And I don't have it on this bullet point, but actually quality in terms of what is dissolved in that water is also extremely important to measure. And the data points that go with that are um, quite numerous, actually. So quality, also very important, which I didn't have a chance to address. Oh, I did. Water quality as impacted by discharges uh, is as important to measure as quantity because water footprinting frameworks often have the concept of gray water, right, which um, you add on to your total water because it uh, accounts for the fact that water use uh, often involves some discharge and some impact of the water quality after you, you've uh, used it consumptively. That's it.